You know, the message this morning is a theme that you're going to find running through the New Testament. Publican or Pharisee? Oh, I call it Pharisee or Publican. I wondered if I got that wrong. Same idea. Uh, there, these are two polar opposites that you find appearing through the teachings of Jesus. And it was in our scripture reading. And Jesus uh, summarized this with a parable. If you have your Bibles, turn please to Luke chapter 18. Luke 18, we're going to start with uh, verse 9. And the sermon does not need to be a long one. Of course, that never stops me, but it's a very short parable and uh, with a very important but sort of a comprehensive truth that's being taught here. Luke 18, verse 9. You only find this parable here in Luke, as you do with a number of others. He also spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector or a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And then Jesus summarized his parable by saying, I tell you, this man, the publican, went down to his house justified, forgiven, rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be abased and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now that is a central teaching in the Bible. He that exalts himself will be humbled, and he that humbles himself will be exalted. The one who has sought the most to exalt himself is the devil. You notice when you read in Isaiah, and Satan is saying, I will exalt my throne, I will be like the Most High, I will lift up myself to the sides of the north. Five times the devil says, I, 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 I. And I circled it here in this parable. Five times the Pharisee says, I, 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 I. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One went seeking after God. One was evidently worshiping himself. Now, as we look at this parable, we're going to take it apart. I think it's interesting to note that it's good that both men went to church. Now, they did several things that were right. They both prayed. They both ostensibly believed in the same God. And so they're, they're coming to church, which is a good thing. These two men, though, really represent the two great classes in the world. You, you notice that you've got one who is a Pharisee, and they're the most zealous and religious, and one who's a publican, and they were the most notorious for being sinful. They're just complete opposites. And Jesus, no doubt there was a gasp that went up from the crowd. When Jesus said, and the publican went home forgiven and not the Pharisee. Because this was so counterintuitive to the teaching of the day that it really was a scandal that Jesus would say something like this. Of course, it was a scandal that Jesus invited a publican to be one of the 12 apostles. Because they were always identified as the big sinners. Zacchaeus. When Jesus said, uh, truly, salvation has come to this man's house today. Remember when he saw Zacchaeus in the tree. And he said, I'm going to eat at your house today. And the crowd murmured it among themselves. Oh, he's going to be the guest of one who is a sinner. And when Mary Magdalene went to wash Jesus' feet in the house of the Pharisee, Simon. Simon said, oh, if this man was a prophet, he would know who and what manner of woman this is that's touching him for she's a sinner. And so there was just this very confused concept of what constitutes righteousness uh, in the world of Christ. And by the way, we have the same problems today. One reason this story is very important, don't miss this very simple truth, one was saved and one was not. We need to know what makes the difference because one went home justified, forgiven. One did not. They both went to church telling me and you there are people who go to church, they pray, they evidently worship, 
and they go home just as lost as when they came. So that's kind of a frightening thought. So we need to take a look at what, what's the distinction? What makes the difference in this story? Somebody got something backwards. When the Pharisee, who everyone thought was the holiest one, he goes home lost, and the publican, who everybody thought was the most wicked one, he goes home saved. I heard about a teenage boy that went on vacation with his family, and he couldn't wait to go out and try his newly rented surfboard and wetsuit. And so he put on his full body wetsuit and grabbed his surfboard, went charging down towards the beach, and there was a lifeguard house there on this public beach in Hawaii. And the waves were especially high that day, and the wind was blowing, and they had some flags up all along this one surfing beach where all the great surfers were out there. And it said, caution, high surf. And no sooner had this teenager plotted off into the water, just knee high, than the, the lifeguard grabbed his bull arm, and he said, you, who just entered the water, get out of the water. You are an unexperienced surfer. And Terribly mortified, the teenager looked around. He knew he was talking to him. He sheepishly took his surfboard and walked back up to the lifeguard booth. And he said, how did you know I'm an inexperienced surfer? He said, well, for starters, your wetsuit's on backwards. <laughs> Zipper's supposed to go on the back so you don't scratch up your board and you've got it in the front. He had it backwards. And sometimes it shows. Some people have salvation backwards. Now, the, we start out with the uh, good things. It says they believed in God. Both these men went to approach God in the house of God. They believe God. That's good. Does everybody who believes there is a God, will they all be saved? The Bible tells us in James 2.19, you believe there's one God, you do well. It's a good thing. But the devils also believe that and tremble because they know their day of judgment's coming. So just believing there's a God is not enough to save you. Matter of fact, uh, it's only the fool who says in his heart there is no God. By the way, that's uh, Psalm 14, verse 1. Isaiah 44, 6. God says, beside me there is no God. And so this is a self-evident truth. There is a God. So they believed in God. That's good. But it takes more than that. They went to church. That's good. We need to go to church. And keep in mind, one man went to church and prayed and he found salvation and went home forgiven. So that's a good thing to go to church. But it's more than just going to church. Um, Solomon requested, remember, when he dedicated the temple, he said, and Lord, whoever play, prays towards this place, here in heaven, answer their prayer. And so they came because they were told to come. You know, it doesn't say this is a Sabbath when they went either. The Jews had hours of prayer. The synagogue was open. There were times of day when they would pray. And so... You remember when Peter and John went to the temple during the hour of prayer and that crippled man was healed at the gates? It doesn't have to necessarily be a Sabbath. It could have been prayer meeting. Oh, by the way, good place to insert an announcement. Next week we're having prayer meeting. Not here. Some of you know that we're going to be having prayer meeting behind Amazing Facts in the auditorium and we're going to start recording the next quarter Sabbath school lessons for prayer meeting. We appreciate those who are willing to come and be part of that uh, study group and you'll be part of the recording um, to come. By the way, you don't have to dress up in your church clothes, but do wear something. But uh, we're going to be coming together. We'll pray together, but we're going to be studying the, um, the, the Sabbath school lesson and it's just something we need to do. We were hoping we'd be in the new building before then. Uh, when we get to the end of this quarter, I had promised the central church that we'd be done with the Sabbath school lesson that they're going to be starting something new there, and so that's our cutoff time. So we'll begin with the book of James, and you can download that at the internet. Okay, back to the sermon. So they went to church, and that's a good thing. But um, someone once said, being in church does not make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger, <laughs> or by standing in the garage is going to make you a car. And so going to church is good, but walking in a church building does not automatically transform you into being a Christian. Some people are afraid to go to church. They think, I'm just not good enough. Another important thing about this story is the publican, who was the most early, unworthy man, did go to church in spite of his being unworthy, 
and he found forgiveness there. Both prayed. Their prayers are very different, but they both prayed. Prayer is very important. It also tells us some prayers are heard, some don't go anywhere. The longer prayer was not answered. The shorter prayer, less eloquent, was answered. You think about it, and the, the uh, Pharisee, he prays a long prayer compared to the publican. The publican's prayer, matter of fact, it's shorter. In English, it's seven words. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. In Greek, it's actually only four words. It's Lord, have mercy is one word, moi, me, sinful person, which everyone understands. He's just saying, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. It is a heartfelt prayer. He smites on his breast. Look at how opposite they are. One, matter of fact, I ought to probably start just by identifying these groups. I remember when I first came to church and someone was talking about Pharisees and publicans, I thought, what's that? You know, in the Bible, we know what Pharisees and publicans are, but the average person on the street, what is a Pharisee? What is a publican? Pharisees were the most religious sect among the Jewish people. They rose up after the time of the Babylonian captivity. See, the children of Israel were carried to Babylon because of their unfaithfulness. They'd gotten into idolatry. They neglected the Sabbath. And so finally, after 70 years in captivity, they could come back to Babylon. A number of them, under the leadership of Ezra and some of the others, said, we need to return to God. We need to be faithful. And they took faithfulness to a new limit. They were very zealous. They didn't want to do anything that resembled idolatry. And they were very careful about their Sabbath observance. They had all these additional laws they had written up about how to keep the Sabbath. So they even measured off how far you could walk on the Sabbath day with a ball of string. And it's like, you know, you'd have a ball of yarn like a cat would play with. And they'd say, if you walk farther than the length of this ball of string, it turns into work on the Sabbath day. And if you carry a handkerchief in your hand, it could be considered a burden. But if you pin it to your clothes, it's part of your garment. And so they would, on the Sabbath, they'd pin their hanky to their clothes because then it's just part of your garment. And just all of these crazy laws. That's why they accused Jesus of breaking the Sabbath. He didn't break the Sabbath. He broke some of the pharisaical laws. So they were very zealous. They weren't all bad. They were very good. Who is it that buried Jesus? Two Pharisees. Nicodemus. And Joseph of Arimathea, they put their necks on the line to recover the body of Jesus. Paul said, I was a Pharisee of a Pharisee. Much in the New Testament is written by a recovering Pharisee. That was Paul, right? So that there, Jesus said, except your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And so they were a righteous group. But it was a, Jesus is saying he wants a better quality of righteousness. Often they got to where they trusted in their zealous obedience for salvation. And by the works of the law, nobody is going to be justified. They could get where they were just trusting in their goodness to be saved. They're a very religious group. Matter of fact, it was an extreme version of the Pharisees called the Essenes. They lived, they also isolated themselves because they realized the world was so sinful. They withdrew and like a community of hermits, they lived down near the Dead Sea they got the water that ran from En Gedi. They had a community down there, frequent bathings and baptisms and washings. It was the Pharisees that accused Jesus' disciples of um, not washing their hands ceremonially before they ate. It was the Pharisees that accused Jesus' disciples when on the Sabbath day they plucked some grain like you eating a cob out of the field. I mean, what a lot of They said, you're laboring, you're harvesting. And so they were just, they, they took obedience to the point of extreme legalism. But then they trusted in their own righteousness. And so it was, uh, it was a whole political party. Now, you might be thinking, well, we don't have Pharisees today, Pastor Doug. Why does this apply? Oh, yes, we do. Anybody who comes to church trusting in their own goodness, or if we come to church and we're proud when we're there to humble ourselves and worship God, and instead we're thinking about ourselves, that's the spirit of the Pharisee. Or if, like the Pharisees' prayer, our prayers are all about us. You notice in his prayer, he doesn't ask for a single thing. What's the request in the Pharisees' prayer? His prayer is an announcement. 
Lord, I thank Thee I'm not like other men. I pay tithe of all that I have. I fast twice a week, and I'm glad I'm not like that extorting publican back there. Their prayer's full of gossip. Have you ever thought of gops, gossips as legalists? And you notice that he's gossiping under, while he's praying. I've seen some really good gossip masquerading as a prayer request. I've got to tell you something you've got to pray about. Come here. Just by saying, I want you to pray about it, it's almost like you can sanctify your gossip, right? And then you begin to talk about what everyone else is doing wrong. Or if you come to church and you're looking at everybody else and you're thinking, oh, you know what that guy's doing? Look at who he's sitting with. How do they get together? You know, she's divorced. Lord, I thank thee I'm not as other men and women. That's the spirit of the Pharisee. It's a horizontal relationship. Instead of looking to God, you notice the publican comes and he's comparing himself with God. He's saying, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. The Pharisee, on the other hand, he comes to church and it's all horizontal. He's looking around at the others, talking about the others, comparing himself with the others. Now, in his prayer, the things that he talks about are good. It's good to go to church. We all need to go to church. Both parties go to church, the saved and the lost. So we need to do that. Uh, someone said once, if you don't have enough faith to get you to church once a week, you probably don't have enough to get you to heaven. And so going to church is important. Prayer is very important. We need to be able to pray on a regular basis and have an ongoing relationship with God. But it needs to be a prayer that talks to God. And so those, those are good things. But um, his prayer is all about what those around him are doing wrong. He says he pays tithe. Is that good? It's good to give, to give to God's cause. He says, I pay tithe of all that I have. You remember Jesus talked about the scribes and the Pharisees that not only paid tithe when they got their paycheck, real simple, you just take 10% off the top, then you got your offerings. But the Pharisees would actually go out to their herb garden where they had their mint and their anise and their cumin. Jesus said, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you pay tithe. This is Matthew it's 21-21. You go, they go out and they take their little parsley and they say, you got 10 sprigs? One goes to the Lord. Then there are cherry tomatoes. You had 10 on the vine? One for the Lord. And they were paying tithe on their little herb gardens. They're extremely fastidious in their washings and their ceremonies. And, you know, all of that stuff in and of itself is good. You know, as a pastor you had to choose between, do I want a church full of people that are sloppy in their tithe pain or they go too far in their tithe pain, which would you want? You'd want those who probably go too far in their tithe pain. And just don't be putting your herbs in the offering plate. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, uh, typically we got the other problem. And he said, I fast. Now is fasting good? Jesus said the time is going to come when the bridegroom will be taken, and then the children of the wedding will fast. And Jesus said, you'll fast. Matter of fact, Christ said, and when you fast, do not be like the Pharisees that disfigure your, their faces in order to appear unto men to fast. You know, they'd want to announce. Jesus talked about the Pharisees that they would pray to be seen of men, and they would give to be seen of men, and they would fast to be seen of men, which I think probably means that when they would fast, They'd cinch up their belt a couple of notches and so that they'd look a little more gaunt and they would pucker their faces, look more drawn and, and leave their hair disheveled and someone would say, are you okay? Oh, I'm fine. I'm just fasting. <laughs> just let everyone know how pious they are. I had a lunch appointment one time with a, a Christian friend and we got there, and I ordered, and I said, what are you ordering? Uh, nothing for me. Do you want to go do Italian instead of Chinese? I said, no. I said, aren't you hungry? Yes. I'm fasting. I said, oh, we did have to meet for lunch, you know. <laughs> so I sat there and ate my lunch. I mean, I was hungry, but I felt guilty, and I felt like, I, I felt like the devil. I felt like I was tempting him. <laughs> no. 
guy's sitting there family. We're supposed to have a business lunch, and I'm eating, and he's looking at my food. I'm thinking, <laughs> make it really bad. I, I don't think they meant to uh, advertise it, but it's kind of weird, you know. You go out to lunch with somebody, and they're fasting. Jesus said, they gave to be seen of men. They prayed long prayers out loud to be seen of men. They fasted to be seen of men. Their religion was they were preoccupied. Where does the Pharisee go in the church? And he goes up to the front. He stands. Wants to be as visible as he can be. Lifts his hands, prays. Not wrong to lift your hands. Make sure they're holy. The Bible says lift up holy hands to God if you're going to do that. Makes a lot of us think twice. And uh, nothing wrong with sitting up front either. You know, boy, we have a hard time in our church getting people up front. At uh, Central Church, we, not here, Central Church, whenever we do Sabbath school, we always have to beg people to come and sit up front because when on camera, it just looks like nobody's there in the front rows. So, but he's sitting up front for the purpose of advertising. Actually, they've already shown that in school, the A students usually sit near the front of the class. And the D students usually are back cutting up, passing notes in the back of the class. You all knew that, right? Now, I've talked a little bit about the Pharisees. They're the ones who uh, had a lot of confidence in their goodness. You ever heard of, uh, some of you remember still who Jimmy Hoffa was? That famous union boss who disappeared and he was considered to be a pretty proud man. He said one time, I have my faults, but being wrong ain't one of them. That was the mentality of the Pharisee. And they were very proud of their ancestry as though they were responsible for it. Jesus said, you garnished the tombs of the prophets. And, uh, but really you're the children of the people who killed the prophets. Who was it that said the smallest package is a man wrapped up wholly in himself? That was the Pharisee. The publicans, now a publican was a Jewish tax collector. But they were especially notorious because the Romans, they would levy so many taxes on the people. And they found it a little easier if they would contract with some of the nationals, the Jews, who spoke the language and understood the customs, they said, you're required to collect so many taxes in these provinces and districts based on the, the traffics and the caravans and so forth that come through. And whatever you keep above our allotment, you get to keep for yourself. So many of them had these contracts and they would become very wealthy extracting taxes from their own countrymen for the Romans and then they'd line their pockets with the extra. And there was a lot of extra. And so they, they worked it. You remember reading there in Luke 19, it talks about Zacchaeus. Luke talks a lot about the publicans, who was very wealthy. He had the contract on Jericho. And it says he was very rich. So some of these publicans, they were like the mafioso back then. They were very wealthy. They go to church, don't they? They're very rich. They were very sinful. That's why in our verse we read during the scripture reading, they were shocked that Jesus would eat with the publicans. Matter of fact, publicans, that word publican was so often uh, married with the word sinner. You can see many places, Luke 15, 1. Then all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him. Now, I'm not suggesting that if you're a tax collector, we live near the capital of California, so there might be some in our midst. I'm not saying that tax collectors today were like biblical tax collectors. It was a whole different scenario. But you're probably not loved any more today than they were back then. <laughs> but they always compared the tax collectors. That was a publican. And the sinners. Matthew 11:19. the son of man came eating and drinking. And they say, look, a glutton and a wine-bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And when a person was cast out of the church for bad behavior, here's what Jesus said, Matthew 18, 17. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. So 
When you were trying to reach around and find the word to describe the lowest caste of society, you know what that word was? Publican. Matter of fact, they would, they would say, if you wanted to get really angry and insult a person, you'd say, you are demon-possessed. You are a Samaritan. You are a publican. And that's, that was cursing back then. So when Jesus told this story, two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and one was a publican. And the Pharisee, he goes to the front and he prays his horizontal prayer, I, 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 I. It's all about me, isn't it? He's really worshiping himself. But the publican, his attitude is very different. He says, he would not even lift up his head. He's got a posture of humility. He's back in the shadows. He smites upon his breast. He's completely overwhelmed with anguish because of his unworthiness and his sin. And all he is asking for is mercy. He's not saying, I am going to do this or I have done this. The only thing he has to ask for is God's mercy. You know that song that uh, Billy Graham used to end every evangelistic crusade? Just as I am, without one plea, except your blood was shed for me. Just as I am. Now, who gets forgiven in this parable? The one who comes asking for mercy. The one who comes knowing that he is a sinner. Now, Pastor Doug, are you suggesting that there might be some here that are publicans and some here that are Pharisees? Yeah. But more likely, all of us play the part of both a little bit. Sometimes when we come like the publican and we ask for forgiveness, then we can slip into the mindset of the Pharisee after we believe we're forgiven. And then we come to our senses and we realize we're acting like a Pharisee and we pray like a publican. Say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And I don't know about you, but I've seen myself in the story more than once in my life. Many times I've caught myself coming to church, comparing myself among myself and wondering what others think of me the horizontal thinking, talking about others in the context of prayer. You ever heard people pray and they're really not talking to God, they're praying for the benefit of others that might be listening. Parents do this with their kids. Dear Lord, please help Johnny do his homework. Johnny's kneeling right there. And help him make sure and help with the dishes in the future and not fight with his sister and is that prayer or is that a lecture for Johnny? You know what I mean? You ever heard people pray up front and you're wondering if they're talking to God or talking for the benefit of those listening to the prayer? That's the publican's prayer. What does the publican ask for? Nothing. You know, Jesus describes the condition of the church in the last days. It's compared to the church of Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3. And he says, you think you're rich and increased with goods and you don't know that you're poor and wretched and miserable and blind and naked. And so the condition of the church, generally speaking, in the last days is a Laodicean pharisaical condition. They're satisfied with what they have. They think that God is lucky to have them in church. And that he's required to save them because of, after all, I've paid my tithe, I've paid my dues, I've tortured myself with fasting. Do we fast because God is somehow pleased that we're, are you supposed to climb up, you know, some mountain on your knees and you get merit for that? Is God wanting us to just torture ourselves to get his attention? You know, there are religions that teach this. There are even Christian religions that teach this. You somehow flog yourself. And it's almost like I've earned it. The Laodicean condition is one rich and increased with goods, feeling need of nothing. That's the prayer of the Pharisee. He doesn't ask for anything. And the only thing the publican asks for is mercy. And he's asking for that four words in his prayer. He's asking for mercy because he's believing that God is a merciful God. And he smites upon his breast. You know, I look at the, um, the story of Peter. I see in the life of Peter, he transitions back and forth through these characters 
of the publican and the Pharisee. When Jesus first comes to Peter and he performs a miracle and he fills his nets and Peter realizes he's in the presence of the divine, he falls on his knees and he prays a prayer of humility. He says, Lord, depart from me. I am a sinful man. And Jesus said, aha, I can use you. Because you know that without me you can't do anything, you follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men. They came, the ones that Jesus called, they came to him realizing that, that they were sinful. But then when they began to argue among themselves which of them was the greatest, and in the upper room Peter says, though all these forsake thee, I'm better than they are, I'll never forsake you. Pharisee. Jesus said, Peter, you're trusting in yourself before the night is over and the rooster crows twice, you'll deny me three times. Oh, not me. That's what he said. I'll die. And you know what? He meant it. Which is something to think about. That Pharisee that prayed, he might have been absolutely sincere. He really did think that he was saved. And he was lost. That scares me. Ought to scare us all a little bit. Like Samson stood up the last time, didn't know that his hair had been cut off, and he went to shake off the Philistines, and his power was gone. He didn't know it until it was too late. It's possible that we might not know the spirit is gone, and we might think we're just fine. That Pharisee went home after going to church and praying. He went home thinking, I'm on my way. Now, doesn't Jesus warn us in the last days, many will come to me? Saying, Lord, Lord, I went to the temple, I'm paraphrasing, fasted, paid tithe, cast out devils, and what will Jesus say? I'm so sorry. Depart from me, you who work iniquity, I don't know you. Your iniquity has not been washed away because you're trusting in yourself. That's serious business. After Peter denied Jesus three times, and then he saw Christ being beaten in the judgment hall. He remembered the words of Christ. He went out and he wept bitterly and he said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Now he was praying the prayer of the publican again and he was forgiven. But it's so backwards from what we think. You know, it's interesting. If you were to have a person take a picture of a congregation, and solely based on their looks and their posture and their clothes, guess which are saved and which are lost? How well would we do? But what does the Lord see? God looks on the heart. Heard a story about a man, he was a businessman in this community. Business was flagging a little bit and he knew he needed more customers and he realized even though he was a, a wretched sinner, I mean he just... Uh, lived a totally world life. He drank and smoked and caroused and he was a sinner. Didn't go to church, didn't believe in God, but he thought, I need to build some relationships in the community. I'm going to go join the Christian church. So he knew what to do. He put on the clothes one Sunday. He went into the church. He said, I've had a dramatic conversion. I've decided to be a Christian. I'd like to be a member here. He manufactured this testimony and they were all thrilled and they oohed and they awed and they welcomed him into the church. In that church, you didn't need baptism. They voted him in. He went home that afternoon, he told his wife what he did. Well, she had a little more moral backbone than he did. She said, you can't do that. She said, that's terrible. She said, you not only lied to the people, you lied to God. She said, you better go right back there and tell them the whole thing is a charade. So next Sunday, the man, he did have a tinge of conscience left. He went back and he stood up in the church. He said, you know, I did something terrible last week. He said, I just made up this whole story about accepting Jesus. And he said, it was all a lie. I'm an awful sinner. And I have no right to be a member of this church. And they all looked at each other aghast and thought, what a terrible thing to do. And they kicked him out. <laughs> so he's walking down the street and he thought, how strange. When I lied to him, they welcomed me in. When I told them the truth, they kicked me out. <laughs> Sometimes we get it backwards. And I think that uh, if Jesus was alive today, we might be surprised said, when you make a feast, the ones who are initially invited, they don't come. says, you go out in the highways and the byways and you find the people, 
the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. He's not talking about having a church full of handicapped necessarily. He's talking about people who realize their weakness. The parable that Luke tells, only in Luke, about the rich man and Lazarus. What do you think the moral of that story is? There is a rich man who feasts. He's wearing purple every day, living it up, poor beggar at his gate. And then all of a sudden in the judgment, their roles are reversed. It's the Pharisee and the publican all over again. The poor beggar is in Abraham's bosom. The rich man, like the Pharisee, he's in torment. He's lost. The story of Cain and Abel, it's the same story. Both claiming to worship the same God. Cain makes no request for forgiveness. His offering is what you would call a thank offering, a supply offering. He brings the fruit of his works. Abel brings a sin offering. And the one who brings the supply offering based on his works kills the one who brings the sin offering. The Pharisee is the one who will want to destroy the publican. I thank thee, Lord, I'm not as other men. I hope that's never part of your prayer. I catch myself sometimes thinking that. I thank thee, I am not as other men. Comparing ourselves among ourselves, you know, Eternal life comes through a genuine repentance. The publican prays the right kind, of his, uh, right kind of prayer. He goes to his house justified. F. S. Bruce said, in the eyes of Christ, a person confessing sin is nearer to true than a godless person who's boasting of his goodness. When David sinned, what did he say in his prayer? The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and a contrite heart, these, O God, you will not despise. James 4.10, humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up. Jesus can save us if we come to him with the attitude of the publican, realizing our weakness. I remember years ago, Mac Davis. Any of you remember Mac Davis? No. Country singer. He wrote a song. He's still alive today. Oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. I can't wait to look in the mirror because I get better looking each day. <laughs> to know me is to love me. I must be one really great man. Oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble, but I'm doing the best I can. That's the prayer of the Pharisee. But the publican, he comes with a broken heart. He realizes that without God, I am nothing. I think it was Martin Luther that said, God creates from nothing, and until we become nothing, he can make nothing out of us. When we humble ourselves and say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Some of the best prayers in the Bible are the shortest prayers. Peter, drowning, Lord, save me. It worked, right? Now, here's the question. The publican goes down to his house justified. Does he then continue to go to church? I believe he does. Does he ever start paying tithe and fasting? When Jesus talked to Nicodemus, the most beautiful words of salvation that we have are John chapter 3. They're words spoken to a Pharisee. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Was Nicodemus saved? When you read the rest of the gospel, he appears among the church. Did he keep going to church? Did he keep paying tithe? Did he keep praying? I'm sure he did. He probably kept fasting. But now he's not doing those things to be saved. He's doing those things because he is received, because he is saved. So that's the big difference. Which are you? Well, if you've got the DNA of the average human, you're a little bit of both from time to time. Some of us, you know, if you grow up in the church and you just have always felt pretty confident about your relationship with the Lord, maybe you're a little more Pharisee and you're trusting in your goodness because you've never been out there done anything scandalous. I'm not recommending you try it either. But I actually had someone that come to me one time and said, Pastor Doug, I don't know if I could ever love the Lord the way Mary Magdalene does. A lady was telling me this. She says, because I'm fourth generation Seventh-day Adventist. I've been in the church. I've never drank. I've never smoked. I've never done any of the terrible things. She said, I feel like I need to go out there in the world and just live it up 
then repent, and then I'll have a testimony. (laughs) And she actually did leave the church and did, last I heard, moved off into a very bad lifestyle. That's not the answer. A Pharisee like Nicodemus can be converted by encountering Christ without making a detour through the world. You want to come just as you are. All you've got to do is realize, that's what Jesus said to the Laodicean church, just know that we're poor and wretched and miserable, blind and naked and humble yourself in the sight of God. He will lift you up. Jesus said, I counsel thee to buy of me the gold tried in the fire that you might have the white raiment to cover your nakedness and the eye salve to embalm your eyes and open them up. There's only two groups when Jesus comes. There's the saved and the lost. There's only two groups in this story. You might say, well, how could everybody be summed up in the story? It doesn't talk about all the lost out in the world. Well, you know, because their destiny is sort of already determined. The only ones who are going to be saved are the lost that approach God. They draw near to God. The publican decided to go to church. He drew near to God. And if we draw near to God, he will draw near to us. He reached out for God. And he prayed that prayer. And God heard his prayer right away. You know, it doesn't go into... what. All his sins were. He never lists what his sins were. That means you can fill in the blank with whatever your sins are. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Did God forgive Peter? The good news in this story is the publican goes home forgiven. A short prayer, a sincere prayer. That means after church today, there doesn't need to be anybody here that will not return home forgiven if we can really pray the prayer that the publican prayed. Coming trusting not in our goodness, but in his mercy. And then by God's grace, live a life that will glorify him because we love him afterward. But we got to get it right at the beginning or nothing nothing else goes right. I thought this was good for me to hear again. Uh, I hope it'll do your heart good.